Hello and welcome to another episode of Crossing the Line, Tales from the Entertainment Industry. I'm Oliver Rednell. And I'm Charlie Cullicutt. Today we speak to Michael Hoffman, Hollywood director of such films as Restoration, The Last Station and Midsummer Night's Dream. In this episode we discuss the trials and tribulations surrounding his unreleased Netflix film Gore, the difficulties of bringing a Shakespeare to the screen, and working with Hollywood royalties such as Hugh Grant, Helen Mirren and Robert Downey Jr. As always, please make sure to like, subscribe, share and review on whatever platform you're listening on. Thank you. Well, I would say committed to celluloid, but that's not the uh, the deal these days, is it? How do you how do you feel about that shooting on digital these days? I'm assuming you've you've shot on both, obviously. I have shot on both. I've shot only. Let me think. I've, I guess I I hung on mm. to film for a long time. I shot the last station on film. Mm-hmm. I shot um, Game Six on film. So the last time I shot on film, I guess was uh, two thousand and. Eight, and then I, then I guess Gambit would have been the first time I shot on on digital. I, I, you know what? I mean, the truth is, what digital was in two thousand eight, you re- really felt like in terms of the look, you're making a, a decision because there were certain kind of effects, textures, grains that were very hard to get, in on in in film. Now, I mean, the the post production process has become so complex i mean sorry so sophisticated and it's so there's so much you can do now to create virtually any look that actually i don't think it makes the same sort of Mm -hmm. difference i used to really absolutely believe that i could tell no matter what that what what, what a movie that a movie wasn't shot on film i'm not even sure i could tell Mm -hmm. for certain anymore Mm -hmm. i would not know that i would have known that i think pt anderson shot licorice pizza on on Super thirty-five or thirty-five. I'm, I'm not sure. I would n- have known it. Mm. In it now. So you think it might be a prejudice that's kind of hung over from when digital was different? Well, again, I think the prejudice is sort of largely going away because I know mm. very few people who shoot. I mean, you know, I, I think the biggest reason to shoot film actually is is you know, an experiential one, almost like, what do you like the feeling of this process? And that is there something that it it inspires in you to be working with this plastic kind of thing you can put your hands on? It's it's interesting. Um, I really love that. I was going to say, it's interesting you mentioned about the difference in in, in film and uh, digital, because I remember close to 2008, I was watching 28 weeks later, days later, and you could definitely tell the difference in the quality of what you were Completely. watching um, and the different Completely. feel that comes across. Yeah. And sometimes it used to have a TV well, there were feel. Even, there were even like, they were actually for a long time, you know, concrete problems with like you'd pan and, and if you pan too quickly, things would pixelate, mm. you know, I mean, there was like real, real like technical issues that hadn't been sorted out yet, but now they have, I mean, the, the Aerie 65, which is the camera we shot the Gore Vidal movie on, is a f- brilliant, brilliant instrument. Mm. I mean, it really is. Mm. It's like so good. It's kind of overkill, mm. you know. Mm-hmm. You shot that in was twenty seventeen. You shot that in twenty seventeen, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Wow. And it's finished it's... in, like, in twenty eighteen. And how long was the sort of editing process? It was. It was a pretty normal length. I mean, we finished. We wrapped in right at the beginning of October. Um, and I think I took a week or two off. My, fam- my famous famous last words of my producer like this has been the most perfect experience <laughs> and, then, and then you went no <laughs> and he just went yeah, oh, I did, no i did, I did, I did. That's right. do, you, yeah. do you know is that still um, just being held by the studio um it's it's yeah it it is an ongoing conversation mm. which i believe at some point we will manage to get the movie out the movie's really good mm. i think i mean i and i wouldn't say that i mean i've i've I joke about it, but it's true. There are certain movies I've made that if they were never if never had come out, I'd been like, "Darn, that's a heartbreaker," <laughs> mm. you know. But but in this case, as a movie, I really it's, I think it's the best screenplay I've written, and I think it's the best movie I've made. So it's, I'm very very frustrated about that. Mm. Um, and uh, Michael Stuhlbarg is gives an extraordinary performance in it. Where did you get um, the idea and, for it? If you don't mind me asking. Um, yeah. Um, well, it's funny because, you know, I'm a believer, you know, I'm not very interested in biopics. 
um, generally, even though I tend to, it seems like that's all I make or work mm -hmm. on, uh, you know, so, but, but I sort of, you know, I'm, I'm not interested in the cradle to the grave thing. And what I'm interested, am interested in is a movie like Amadeus, which is a story that, you know, it's a slice of life with that and somehow you get the advantage of it being of the branding and marketing hook that comes with being about Mozart and Salieri. But in a way you tell that story, whether it was about Mozart and Salieri or not. And I think my movie, The Last Station, about the last year of Tolstoy's life is quite similar on that level. Um, and then, and the Gore movie is, is as well. So what I was looking for, so the way it came about, my friend Jay Perini, um, who'd written the novel that Last Station was based on, had been the executor of Gore Vidal's estate. And he'd written his biography and very, very early on came to me and said, look, I'll option this to you for a dollar if you if you write write screenplay with me and um and 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 so I read it and there was like I was just like I don't see what the movie is because it was very much a traditional biopic or bi biography and uh you know a recording of a life from the beginning to the end and um I so I kind of thrashed around with it in my my brain for a while and I finally went to him and said okay Jay just tell me the the highest and lowest point in Gore's life as you knew him and he he said that's interesting because they happened within six months of each other and I went ah that's a movie yeah and so that's that became you know the starting point is a moment in time where Gore Vidal runs for the United States Senate and a very much of a young social was kind of very is a democrat but it's very it's very very left-wing um, and, uh, you know, and, and he, he's defeated, right. And he goes back to his house in Ravello and he has this, you know, he's been commissioned to write this novel about Abraham Lincoln. And he just, he, he, I don't know if he can't write, he doesn't want to write anyway, whatever, whatever it is, he's drinking two fifths of scotch by 10 in the morning and he's just fucked up all the time. Mm -hmm. And so, so Howard, um, Austin, his longtime uh, companion finds a, a a fan letter from a kid who'd recently come down from Oxford who wanted to write historical fiction and had written to Gore and said, you know, could could I come and visit you? Would you give me some advice? And so Howard wrote back as Gore and invited the boy to come. And he shows up with his fiance, thinking he's going to sit at the feet of the master. And uh, Gore looks at him and he just falls in love with him. It's just at a point that he's very broken. He reminds Gore of this kid he was very much in love with when he was young, who died in World War II. Anyway, it's a so it ends up being a story about how much of a how much we're willing to give up of ourselves to get what we want, and everybody's involved in that same drama. I mean, I've, I'm a big believer that you know you need to be able to say in a sentence or a word, you know, ideally what the film you're making is about. Like for me, The Last Station is about the difficulty of living with love and the impossibility of living without it. And every scene is about that. The Gore movie is about, you know, like I said, what, what, are, how, what are we willing to compromise? How much of ourselves can we give up to get what we want without losing ourselves? Mm. Every scene, every scene, every relationship is about that, you know? So, um, so anyway, so yeah, so that's that's sort of the setup of the movie, and it and it goes downhill from there. <laughs> when you're making something that is based heavily on truth or literally truth itself, how do you how do you match when you want to do something more creative and it might you might have to skirt around something that actually happened? How do you make that decision? Because obviously some films have done it greatly and been heavily criticised, but how how do you make that sort of creative choice? Well, I think actually it's interesting you say truth because I would say that the question you're really asking me is what do you do when you're working with something that's based on fact? That's right. Because yeah. I think truth is a slightly different thing. Sure. Truth, narrative, narrative truth, truth and narrative is also, there's an interface between fact and myth or fact and fable, you know, when you work on a, work on a story. And, and it's, it's, I think, you know, you're, you're, you're in the end, your allegiance is strangely enough, I think, to the fable, mm. to the, to where the, because that's where the, 
where the power, the resonant power lies in the story, right? So, I mean, I had one a very concrete one in uh, in Last Station because so the character James McAvoy plays, his name is Bulgakov, and he's he's he was very valuable to me as a character because he's somebody. It's, it's about the last six months of, of Tolstoy's life. It's from you know starts in January and goes to October or eight months or whatever that is, and um, this guy Bulgakov came to become to come be, to be Tolstoy's private secretary in January. So you're starting, you're starting out with a character who doesn't know anything in the same way the audience doesn't know anything. So it's incredibly useful in terms of finding ways to pull exposition out, you know, because he needs to know like we need to know, um, which actually creates some kind of complex point of view questions, which I hopefully solved in a in a, in a in a useful way when we can talk about that. But um, in answer to this question, so Bogokov is, is interested in the purity of this Tolstoyan vision of, of a kind of superhuman love that Tolstoy had, you know, Tolstoy at a certain point in his life had been kind of a wild womanizer and then he got married, but he was still quite, and then he'd had this conversion experience and had become kind of like, you know, like a prophet, you know, and he was mm -hmm. really looked up to as a spiritual leader. And he started, a, there was a religion started called Tol Tolstoyism and, and, you know, was, he had a kind of, he if he were Jesus, he had a guy, his St. Paul, who was a guy named Cherkov, who sort of ran this whole international movement. For Britain, for Britain, it was huge in Britain, especially in Scotland. There were 70 Tolstoyan churches in Scotland in, in 1910. Yeah, you know, it's really mm -hmm. crazy. Whoa. Yeah. So anyway, so, so it's, a, it's, it's about, so he shows up completely idolizing Tolstoy. And then he starts to see that actually here's this, the prophet of love who can't make his own marriage work and how problematic his relationship is with his wife. Meanwhile, he's having his first love affair. So you're starting to see, you know, look at the older couple and see what the younger couple might become and looking at the younger couple and thinking about this is what the older couple were at one point. And this is, and it, you know, then the gap in between is what's can or and, and might be lost, right? So anyway, in, in fact, when Tolstoy ran away from home at 82 to get away from his wife, um, he, he, he left with his doctor and his daughter, Sasha, but not with Bulgakov. Bulgakov actually had, let, had stayed initially with Sophia, the Tolstoy's wife, and then had ended up going to Moscow to try to find this, this woman who had been left the community because she felt it too, was too restrictive and hypocritical. Anyway, so in the early drafts, you were intercutting between what was happening at this train station, the last station, Astapovo, where Tolstoy was in the process of dying and, and, and McAvoy trying to track down his true love. At a certain point, Someone wrote me a letter who some a dear friend read the script and said, I don't think the script is going to work. I think you really need to think about this, the third act. And I went back and I thought, you know, there's many things I'm changing in terms of the 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 facts of the narrative here. Why why am I hanging on to this? And so I rewrote it very near the time we shot and and had Bulgakov go to the train station, which he didn't really, but it absolutely made the movie work. So I don't, I mean, the otherwise, it just became too diffuse and too bifurcated the focus at a moment where I needed to be doing that, it was doing that. Mm -hmm. So, do you, yeah, do you, so anyway, that's a long, long answer. No, no, excellent, it was excellent. Um, do you prefer doing historical pictures rather than, because you've done, you've done real sort of, a real range, a real eclectic mix of, you know, comedy and romance as well? I, I mean, I love, I mean, I've always, from the time I was a little kid, really loved history and I really love period world. So I do really like that. And I'm just trying to think of like what I'm doing now. I've yeah, got another script about, which is another one of these sort of kind of contracted biopics about Johannes Kepler, mm -hmm. 
and um, his mother, who was who was accused of witchcraft, died right, yeah. in witch trials. When and it's it's that story, and Helen Mirren's attached to that, mm-hmm. and Michael Stuhlbarg as well at the moment. And we're out to somebody else to play Kepler. We'll see how that goes. But um, but then I've also last year wrote a a love story, a kind of eccentric love story set in Sardinia and London. That so that's completely was completely, you know, a fabrication. Someone told me this little tiny kernel of a story of something that happened to their sister. And and I was like, and I have no idea why that percolated away and needed to be told. Cause I mean, it was, it was, but the story was told is very, almost nothing like what the movie is, but it was just, you know, there was something mm. strange that attracted mm. me of this anecdote. Mm. I just, so sometimes I, I don't know, you know, you, I always think that, you know, we, it, we are, creatures that have it's it's almost like we have there's you know the constellations in the sky but we have constellations inside of us which are in the form of archetypes and when we recognize something in a story it's it's as if those those archetypes start to light up and we feel them and when you can feel that and can start to hear that voice or feel that rhythm then you know you realize you can write it it's it's really interesting to hear the way you talk, Michael, about uh, films and stories. I know you did Midsummer Night's Dream years and years ago. I mean, Midsummer Night's Dream is something I've had a long relationship with. I've acted in it, I think, four times. I've directed it on stage twice. I've, 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 you know, I've had I've had a long relationship with with the play. So I thought about it a lot and why I thought Italy in the nineteenth century was a good idea. But I just, for some reason, could see Kevin in that situation and i knew you know one of the the hard things about midsummer night's dream as opposed to i mean there's many hard things about doing shakespeare in film but 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 the hard thing about that play as opposed to say macbeth or i mean if you're doing macbeth you know you're basically in macbeth's point of view mm. or you're telling his story you, you know in it's it's Midsummer Night's Dream is very, you know, is is very different than that. It's not, there is no organizing point of view in the movie. The organizing, I mean, there's an organizing idea about love, but and it's craziness. But but so I had to kind of choose, you know, a way to tell it, somebody to travel with. And I think it was an unlikely choice, but I think it worked quite well mm. to choose bottom and make him into this, you know, person who was. Kind of broken and and didn't have any love in his life and having this strange encounter with in the in the woods where he had for one minute something that you know was was a, you know received some sort of gift but but in terms of the other stuff the archetypical I, I really did sort of think well what does it mean you know what is what is what is the fairy world in in if I'm in 19th century Tuscany and I read this really this really obscure book that was public, you know, written just in Italian in the 1870s or 80s by this, um, uh, not anthropologist, what would you call him? Um, a myth, I don't know, mythologist or whatever. And what he talked about is that this idea that existed in the Tuscan peasantry that when the Etruscans became less powerful after they were conquered by the Rome. They actually, many of them left to the woods and they, because they, then the less, less powerful they became, the smaller they became. And so they became these beings that lived in the woods, but they were that descended from the ancient Etruscans. And I thought that is a crazy ass idea. But so I sort of like grabbed onto that and thought, you know, what if I pull some Etruscan iconography in and some Roman iconography in and try to make a world that, you know, that somehow, that somehow what, that somehow, I don't know, in a way richer and more imaginative than than the, the world of the mortals. Although I don't, you know, I don't think, I, I mean, if I had the mood to do the movie over again, I, would, I think I would attack it mm. quite differently. Um, I think I would cut more language for sure. Mm. I think that one of the problems of, you know, if you're saying, you have a character saying, I know a bank where the wild time blows and you're and you're panning across a bank where the wild time blows. I mean, the effect is just basically white on white. Mm. It's not very interesting. Sure. You know, so you've got to figure out, I would get cleverer about the way I use counterpoint 
and I still don't think I know how to to do the forest at night is a very hard it, it was a very hard thing I'm not sure we made the right decisions at all mm -hmm. we you know we thought about doing it in a real forest at night and the complications in terms of lighting were just so extreme and and so then we you know we build that forest on the biggest sound stage in Europe you know it looks tiny it looks ridiculous like the way we experience exterior spaces and interior spaces I don't we don't even know how how much space we need before we feel the expanse of a forest I mean now also probably because we couldn't afford it at the time but now there would be you know a set extension option mm. you know which is probably would probably be the right answer mm. to be to surround your set with a big green mm. screen and then extend constantly sure. with cgi sure. would you like to do another shakespeare on film yes i'm i'm working on something right now would you care to say i was what? about to say would you share i don't i don't want i don't want to say okay i don't want to say because it's too it's too vulnerable okay sure <laughs> someone might try and, and steal it you know what i mean yeah it's a good idea sure i'll tell you what is, is that a hint so when you yeah. so when you have a project like that an idea what would you then do who do you go to mm. obviously you know a lot of people you've been in the game uh, oh, for many years i don't know i mean in that because i feel quite calm where would i go with this idea i mean first of all i would you know, map it out. I mean, I have some pretty clear notions of ways I, I think that I can make it feel relevant and like it, like there's a reason to do it right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know who I'd go to as an Italian line producer. I know how to access the Italian tax credit. Um, I would think about shooting in Puglia because of the regional fund. Um, if I were looking in Italy, you know, because it's the best regional fund, mm -hmm. certainly in the South. Um, but who would I go to? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think actually in the case of that, what I would do is try to make my life easier by casting it first, by getting a cup, because I do, I mean, one of the great things about doing Shakespeare or Chekhov or, or I imagine, you know, Arthur Miller or whatever is that it's, it's actor bait mm. for sure. Mm. I mean, people want, you know, people want the opportunity to, to, to play those roles. And so it ends up, you end up being, you know, being able to put together a very strong cast and usually you can get, create a sort of favored nation situation with people in terms of what you're paying them. So you can keep the movie basically affordable because, you know, Shakespeare's also only going to have so, I mean, it'll have a really long life, like Midsummer Night's Dream, is a movie I still get checks from. Mm. It's probably the only movie I've ever made, even though I've made some movies that made a lot of money that I actually get, you know, not not just re residual checks, but royalty checks. Mm -hmm. So the movie's in profit. I mean, I talked to Kevin Klein the other day and he said, you know, he only made, they all took $15,000 a week to make the movie. I mean, Michelle Pfeiffer, Kevin, whatever. Mm. But Kevin said, I made a fortune from the movie really and she said because the deal he made was i mean the deal that fox made which was a really unlikely deal they said when the movie says it's made 15 million dollars in variety in box office mm -hmm. from that point we'll pay residuals right and they and they were as good as their word and so the movie and the thing is the movie just goes you can't find a kid in America who didn't have to sit and watch it in class. That's right. We were yeah. saying that. We were talking about that earlier. Yeah. yeah. That we both watched yeah. it at school. It has a really long life. So even if, if it, you know, the movie didn't make a ton of money in the beginning, but it has over time mm. been a very valuable piece of property for 20th century Fox. Mm. Mm. Do you prefer writing or do you prefer directing? I know they're very different, but is it, do you have a preference for I one? No, I prefer, I, I, I really, you know, obviously during lockdown, I was, I was writing a lot and I've been writing a television series, which I have never done before with a, with a writing partner named Bob Martin, um, a Canadian talent, really talented guy, mostly a theater writer, but he's very funny. And so that's been really intriguing to learn that form. And then we had to like, originally the people we developed it for wanted to, anonymous content wanted us to write it as an hour and so we wrote it as an hour and then when we sold it to epics recently now they they wanted half hour so we have to take the pilot and figure out how do we make those episodes in into half hours how do we take the whole season arc which was 
10 one hours and turn it into to 10 half hours, but retain what we want and make the story still function. So that's, it's been, you know, I, that, that all those structural problems, I really find intriguing mm. to solve. Are you happy to talk about what this TV show is about? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. It's, um, it's called American classic. It's, it's Kevin again, playing a Broadway actor who gets canceled for um, this, this reviewer just keeps giving him terrible reviews and he ends up doing kind of a Will Smith. Right. Okay. okay. Hitting him in a restaurant Current and politics. then he ends up, yeah. And he happens to be gay and Asian. And so he ends, Kevin gets canceled. This coincides with getting news for his, of his mother's death. And he goes back home to this little town in Pennsylvania. And you find out that his family's run a, a theater there, which was, he looked at it as like this temple of art that he grew up doing the classics with and they and classics with his family and with, and his, 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 uh, now it's being run by a woman who used to be his girlfriend, who's now married to his brother. Who was, they were all part of the theater company and unbeknownst to him, they've turned it into a dinner theater mm -hmm. to survive. And he finds this so shocking that over the, his mother's dead body and the funeral service, he swears he's going to come back to the town and, and reinvent mm. this, the theater. Mm. And so it's just, it's, it's just a comedy mm. based on. Did you write that. this part for, for Kevin, Kevin Klein, everyone, for everyone listening? I did. Yeah, you did. I did write it for Kevin. Yeah. Mm. I wrote it for him and with him. Mm. I mean, he was very, very involved in the development of it. He's a producer. Sure. Well. You're, you're not, you're not scared about, or you're not, you never he seemed hesitant about tackling current, cultural trends which is this is very much part of and then yeah. Sort of satirizing yeah it. yeah 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 no, no i mean well i think i mean i think with tv with, with some that with the tv comedy like that i think you just benefit from mm. that um yeah there's a lot of interesting stuff because it's also a generational story because Kristen, the woman who's married to to kevin whose name's uh richard bean mm. and married to his brother john um She's the mayor. She's become mayor of this town. And so she's also, you know, she's also in a kind of constant battle with her 18 year old daughter about because her mother used to be this political activist who's become this more bread and butter politician now. And she wants to bring this casino to town and the and the daughters and her friends are really pushing back against it. And there's all this, this pressure to try to get the Richard character either come down on one side of the issue or this. So it's a lot about it's a lot about community, I'd say you know mm. it's about community and storytelling and you've worked with a lot of the same actors but specifically Kev kevin klein when was the first time 1991 was it on soap dish is that the first time yeah, i worked with down yeah downey and kevin and sally field all of whom i've worked with again mean, i've worked with downey a couple of times mm. since then is it is um, it interesting how is it to see them progress as actors each mm. time you work with them do you see a difference in their sort of skill and what they bring to a role oh, that's a really interesting question i don't know i mean one of the things it was you know it was really interesting with downey because we because i had a long conversation with him about playing the gore gore vidal mm -hmm. role and he was really interested and i went to california and we hung out and he did a makeup test and he did all that and finally he decided that he didn't think he could do it and, and and i remember the conversation we had because it is a kind of a it's a very it's a nuance, but it's a pretty dark, fucked up character. Sure. And he said to me when he passed, he said, you know, I think the thing I've come to understand is I, I really, at this point in my life, I'm ha happier being a brand than an actor. Mm. And I thought oh. that was really fascinating. Um, it's quite humble as well and, to actually know that, you know, what. Well, what you're, I think also we just, I mean, I don't really know because I'm not, I mean, I love Robert. I think he's a great human. He's a, just a fabulous human being. And, um, and he's been a, good friend and a good collaborator and we've had lots of near misses on other things but i do think that you know that he's and you know he he, he came back you know that's he's sure. like the person who is the best argument against their no second acts in american mm, life yeah i mean he's had an incredible second act if he's become the most highly paid actor in the world mm -hmm. you know and um and i think he's liked being in charge, being, having some control, being, you know, being able to decide when he makes, he and Susan have a great marriage and they have a, you know, a kind of common vision of the sort of things they want to do. And so, and they like making big entertainment, you know, and, and so I don't think, you know, I still think, I still think, and I, he, we always talk about it, like, we got it. We have one more in us. We have one more in us, which I thought was going to be 
the Gore movie. So I think I think I I really hope we'll make another movie together. But but I also understand why, you know, he's having an incredible time. He's got two new little kids and and this marriage, like I said, and a film company, and they're making TV, and they're you know so, and they're making you know inter- interesting stuff. So you know, I don't know. Did you know his dad yeah. through filmmaking? I knew his dad through sitting around the dinner table. Right. Not, right. Not, okay. Not, not, not through, not really other, I didn't know him other than to socialize sure. with, I mean, I knew, I know his movies. Yeah. Yeah. But of course. I, I just, we have friends in common. And so he used to be, I used to be at dinner parties with him mm. quite often. Mm. You talk so much about, you know, just before, you know, all the right people to talk to, you know, how to get something moving, particularly in Italy, this thing that you want to get going. Is there anything that you have, this can sound bad, but have you ever failed at something that has taught you such a great lesson moving on? I, you know, I do. A, I did a master class in, again, in Italy with those, all this, these Italian filmmakers. And the whole thing was about what I've learned in my, as a creator, what I've learned through my failures. Mm. That's was that's the whole, I do a whole master class about that because I think you learn, I mean, I know it's a cliche to say, you never learn more than you do when you fail, but Gambit was a movie where I, I had this strong intuition that I needed to rewrite the first act of it and the producerial affection for the fact that it was a Coen Brothers script. Mm. I sort of didn't assert myself as much as I would in any other, other case in terms of the rewrite. And I think I didn't establish a really elemental um, aspect of the relationship between Colin Firth and Cameron. And because I didn't, I hadn't, the story was never set up right. And it was always a battle to make it fall into place. Mm. And it was because I was, I don't know that I was, I wasn't so much intimidated by it's, it's this weird thing you get into. You have to be really careful about it. And I've done it on another movie as well in a different way is you have, you're surrounded by people who are invested in the script or who love the script or who, for whatever reason, don't want it to change. And they start telling you, you know, everything's, it's so great. It's so great. Everything is so great. And you, because you've got so many other pieces shifting and changing around you, you don't, you want that to be true. Hmm. You really want it to be. I mean, just think of yourself, you know, you, you write a screenplay, your fantasy is, you wrote a first draft and somehow you just knocked it out of the park, mm. right? So if everybody in the world tells you you've knocked it out of the park, you're like, well, even if you have a creeping dread somewhere, you that's very hard to kind of go, you know what, this thing that's moving forward, this thing everybody's invested in, I'm going to take it apart and I don't know what's going to happen when I take it apart. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, a, that's a, a situation that it's easy to get into. And the other thing is that you can do or that I've done is you get so caught up in a certain aspect of the story, like the visual aspect. I mean, I'm thinking of restoration, the design of restoration and the world of restoration that we're creating, which, you know, wins an Oscar for costume design, wins an Oscar for production design, but I never really sorted out the script, not in the way I knew that the, that it was a, unwieldy animal that it was somehow because the mo- the novel breaks down into four parts that the three act structure of it was kind of unwieldy um that 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 there was a there was an issue with because it's narrated in the first person that there was so much information that i was convinced was in the film because i knew it even though you know the the it's something I know in the character. I know what's going on in his head, mm. but I, but it actually in terms of the character's actions, because he wasn't very active, the audience couldn't know it. Mm. So, so, so um, anyway, that's a long answer again to, you know, things that you get wrong and what you learn, what you learn is I'm never going to make that mistake again. Mm. I'm going to be next time. I'm going to like, when I got to the last station, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to worry so much about creating 19th century Russia. I'm going to focus on these relationships and these characters and know that every scene in the movie is about what I think, it, what I want it to be about, mm. you know, just keep from getting distracted. Another great example of a, of a, something that I, 
learned a tremendous amount from is on Midsummer Night's Dream. It was a certain point I'd storyboarded it to the nth degree, every, every frame of the movie. And I suddenly realized I'm shooting the storyboard. I'm not seeing what's in front of me. Mm. I'm not seeing the gift that the universe has given me. That was, that's been a huge revelation to me. That's changed my work completely that I now really, yes, I prepare, but I'm, I'm very present, very there in the moment. I really see what's happening. And I, and I listen with my head and I listen with whatever that intuitive part of us is. And I respond to what I'm being given. And it really changes. It really changed has changed me as a creative person. I, I was going to say, it sounds very much like uh, you hear a lot of actors when they get, they talk about, you know, how do they prepare? And there's a level of, you know, I prepare, I prepare, prepare. And then when I turn up on the yeah, day, get, I chuck it. it go. Yeah, mm. I have to let gotta, it go. Yeah. Mm. Do, You've got to be present. You've got to be present. Despite what you say about restoration, I, th- I still think it's a pretty enjoyable watch. And it's very clear, the sort of yeah. journey of the character. Yeah, maybe too clear. Yeah. Right, um, right. No, but I, I just mean that, yeah, it's. I just think that, I mean, it was, I just remember when Harvey Weinstein came into the cutting room at one point and we were working on the last, the third act and he goes, he's got it, Merrillville, that the character mm. Robert plays. Mm. Maribel, he's got to cure the plague. I'm like, Harvey, you can't cure the <laughs> yeah. plague, dude. It's not going to happen. <laughs> and I said, but he's got to. You know, he's our hero. And I'm like, well, yeah, but he can't cure the plague. Maybe he can. But then what do I do? I come up with some lame ass idea that he creates a sort of hospice for people and he's not afraid to deal with people with the plague. And it's so soft and, and it's just not. I don't maintain the same. You know, there's a lot of great things in the mm. movie. I agree. I really there's there's scenes and sequences and that I really love. And I love Sam Neill. Mm. I think he's wonderful as Charles II. And I think Ian McKellen, it's very interesting to see him being so mm. soft mm. and clumsy and 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 generous. Mm. You know, it's not like people usually he's usually more angular and more um sharper. And he's like and Downey, I think Downey's great. I think Downey has some wonderful fucking moments mm. in the movie mm. wonderful so yeah i'm very proud yeah this is all like you know i'm i'm proud of the movies i'm like I, there's many there's almost but but i would say you know it's like everything that's i mean the fun strangely the gore movie comes the closest of anything ever made where i would say pretty, pretty much every beat of it is what i intended there's there's like two things that I'd like to go back and change. And one of simply realizing that there's a line of dialogue that I don't need, that I would just drop out. So you can do that now help. because it's still not out yet. Are you still able to edit that and change that? Um, well, it would be a bit of a drama okay. to go back. And, okay, you know, so it's locked we've, now. We've delivered, we've delivered to Netflix. and But, you know, if somebody if somebody bought it, you know, if we, or we got back into a situation where we might actually – get it out in the world in some form, then I would make a, it's not, you know, one of the things is literally like, I feel like there's probably on one cut, it's, it's cut about three frames too tight. So that's like one of them. And the other one is this one line of dialogue that Douglas Booth says that I would just literally drop out. I mean, he just doesn't need to say, he, he it's something he doesn't need to say. And the movie would be, it'd be a bit more intriguing and a little less, it's there's it's just it, there's this one moment that just feels a tiny bit cloying to me that it doesn't i don't think it affects anyone's enjoyment it, except mine mm-hmm. it goes back to that show not tell thing you were talking about earlier with the well river. yeah exactly yeah. it's a, it, it's one of those and it is a movie already that there's i mean but you know there's nothing wrong with talk when talk is good there's a lot of really good dialogue in the mm-hmm. gore movie i think really i really like the way it's written. It's interesting to see Hugh Grant in Restoration because he's kind of had this... Oh, he's funny. Yeah, he's, oh, he's, 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 really... he's kind of got he's this... He's a very, very funny actor. He is. And then he went through a long stage of his sort of rom-com stage and now he's sort of come out of, get, out of that and doing a real myriad of different parts. But you, you found Hugh Grant, am I right, in thinking that and put him in your oh, first yeah. film? I mean, yeah. we were at Oxford together yeah. and yeah, he was in the film, but I, I can't take credit for his... Anything, any, his, he's an immensely talented guy, an immensely funny human being. So you studied together, um, did you? Yeah, yeah, well, studied together in that we, yeah, we were both reading English at Oxford, but he was at New College, I was at Oriel, and I just, I knew him from Pierce Gaveston Society, and I knew him from 
theater stuff and you just you had lots of friends in common and then and I always but I did always I was always a believer I always was like you know that in fact I remember when Patsy Pollock came up who was a who was casting Tarzan that Tarzan that Hugh Hudson directed that um and they were looking for you know young 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 actors and I introduced them to Hugh at that point just and then later I was going to do this show little there was these three short stories, this program. They I can't remember if it was HBO or Showtime, but um, and and I I cast Hugh in this short story, and then I decided in the end not to make it. I just didn't like it. The it was it was well. I used to find reasons not to do lots of things. Not anymore. Now I find reasons to do things. Yeah, yeah. You would you like to work with him again? With Hugh. Mm. Sure. Mm. Yeah, he's, he's 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 an extremely extremely smart guy. Mm. Yeah, that's great instincts. He'd be a good director. He's a good writer, mm. actually. He wrote a screenplay. He sent me one time. It was really funny. Mm. And uh, other people or creatives, not just actors, who you haven't worked with, who you'd like to work with? Sure. Well, you know, I mean, as much as I loved making Last Station with with Helen and 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 Chris, I you know initially. Meryl Streep and Tony Hopkins were attached mm. to it. And I've had work come close to working with Tony twice and Meryl, Meryl Streep I love. So yes, I mean, those two for sure. Um, well, I was close to talking and she's a friend of mine, but I would really like to work with her as Helena Bonham Carter. Mm. I just, because I love being around mm. her and she's, I think she's grown into something really remarkable. And so maybe that will, will come back around. Mm. Um, Fingers crossed. So, um, I mean, there's, I mean, I, you know, I'd love to work with McAvoy again. I really liked working with James. Mm. He's a really talented guy. Um, uh, like I said, I'd love to work with Downey again. I'd love to work with, um, I don't know. There's a, there's a, there's a ton. Of, I mean, I love Emma Stone. I mean, just off the top of my head. Um, I love, uh, um, I mean, there's so many people. Mm, of course. For Lawrence. Of course. I mean, I mean, I watched. I, I you know, was there was a long time that I was sort of obsessed with. I really wanted to work with Ben Stiller after I saw there's something about Mary, and I just think the guy's just a comic mm. genius. So that was, I've been come close a couple of times, and we've talked about stuff that's never quite come together. He doesn't really um, do films anymore, does he? Yeah, does he's, he? He's doing um not a film, but he's going to do The he Shining, isn't he? On bro- on uh, the West End. Yeah, so, so at the theatre, but like, yeah, in terms yeah. of films, he does. He's got. No, he, he directs. I don't know. He directs I've, I've well. sort of lost. Oh, okay, all right, mm. fine. I've stopped. I've stopped worrying about it. But I did watch um, Flirting with Disaster the other mm. night again with a bunch of people over here. What a brilliant movie! Mm. Have you ever seen it? The David not Russell not not, I not recently. I have seen it, but not oh, recently. Yeah, it's so good. That was one of his it's early so ones, good. wasn't it? David Russell. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was after. It was before of the debacle of I Heart Huckabee. Oh yeah, and yeah. It's, but it was, but it was, and it was not a big success. But 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 there's no reason it shouldn't have been because no. it's a brilliant movie. Mm. Well, you, brilliant. Well, that's the thing with film. You don't know, do you? Depending on when it's released and what other else is coming out. At the yeah, same yeah, time. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I think it was also that they sold it as something slightly bigger than it was. It's a pretty, you know, as most of David Russell stuff is, is pretty personal and eccentric, and especially then, you know. Mm. But they were great. Those early movies of his, Spanky the Monkey, is a brilliant movie. Mm. Mm. Have you ever seen that? Uh, yeah, I've seen that. As well. Yeah, really yeah, funny. Good. Really good. Um, <laughs> really funny. Michael, I, I wanted to ask for you know young directors who are starting out today. If there was a piece yeah. of advice you could give to them, or ways that you would point them, is there anything that you would share? Well, I just I mean mostly what I would say is it's all about you know for for a young director to get a sh- shot at directing without going through years of one kind of apprenticeship or another in the editing room or in the camera department or whatever, it's all about writing. Mm. You know, you've got to get yourself attached to a piece of writing that somebody wants to make. You don't have to write it, but, but it's great if you can, but it's also great if you can find a writing partner. So you make a kind of, and I also just think, you know, what everybody says, make as much film as you can, but, but, but I'm also, you know, would say be rigorous with yourself, be exacting with yourself. I think there's this tendency with short films where people are like, I'm going to do a, what do you call it? Go fund me campaign for my short film. And, and then I'm going to kind of go out and express my self artistically. I'm like, you know, no, if you get that opportunity to make a short film, be hard on yourself mm. and make 
film that people are going to want to watch because it's a great story. Not, you know, falling back and saying, you know, well, I was being, I wanted it to be ambiguous and I just wanted everybody to have a different interpretation. You know, fuck off. Just <laughs> tell a story. It's the one thing that makes me the most insane is, and you know, you I go into writing cl- classes and workshops and stuff and I say, okay, just tell me a story. And people can't do it. Mm. They can't just tell a story. Mm. It's such good training. Just tell a story. I was about to say, there, there's enough story. There's enough self-indulgence in mm. the artistic world. Aye, aye, aye. Or, or wankers yeah, without I agree. Us, uh... I'm, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not about that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not interested in tourism. I'm not interested in, you know, I, I really think we have a, we're lucky to have this job as storytellers and we should take it seriously. Mm. And there's a social slash spiritual responsibility in it. It's a very important social function and we should, you know, we should, respect that mm. yeah, it reminds me of what i heard you say before about the um francis Ford coppola and when he said about the heaven thing yeah yeah that was yeah that i thought was about very, that a lot and i told charlie about yeah. it the day you said it actually it's very impressive and man it was very very impressive that him 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 saying that i and i and i think it's true i mean we should be we are you know this is a blessed enterprise we're engaged in we're it's incredibly lucky to get to to, we're incredibly lucky to get to do it, and there's a responsibility. Just because I think implied. we've opened the door a little bit there, would you mind telling us the story just so our listeners can hear it as well? Oh yeah, no, no, it was just it was just this. Yeah, Francis Coppola was, and I really hooked related to it because I spent a lot of the early part of my career really consumed by anxiety myself. But what he was talking about it was a it was a, a interview I did with Steve Soderbergh that was attached to the last version of. Paul Clips now the final redux or whatever whatever it was anyway and he was talking about how when he made the godfather and when he made apocalypse now and when he was really kind of on the top of the on top of the world in terms of being you know number one choice for virtually any movie that hollywood was going to make he said i was just so unhappy all the time and i made myself miserable you know being self critical being joyless being unable to to see what was in front of me, what was good. I just was so, I, I was just unhappy all the time. And then he said, and you know, I've come to realize now later in life that this is heaven and we have the choice, we have the choice to, to, to see that, you know? And for all those years, I didn't see that I was in heaven. I felt like I was in hell, but I wasn't in hell. I was in heaven. I was, I had this extraordinary opportunity to tell extraordinary stories and now, now I see it and now I'm, you know, and life was transformed by just realizing that this is heaven right now and ain't going to get any better than this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I remember when Ollie told me that and it was uh, at the time uh, stuff's going on in my life, but you see it all as kind of stepping stones and how you would only get to where you are at the moment by going through that yeah. Uh, yeah. kind of penitence, you might say, but mm-hmm. it's worth it. At yeah, the yeah, yeah, sure. No, people get, people get very hooked on the idea that that creativity is in, is is it comes from suffering or is connected to I don't think it is I think it is it can be con- connected to struggle but I don't think struggle and suffering are the same thing um you know it's not it's, yeah suffering is I the mean, consequence isn't it rather than struggle is the kind of process of going through it yeah and and, uh, and of course sometimes you're going to go you know as you climb up the mountain you're going to you know going to if whack your shin on a rock. The other thing that's that that I've really come to understand is the difference between trying and allowing, and 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 that being a huge part of of how I how I create now. That I used to really think I you know I don't know what the end is, but I'm gonna just if I think hard enough, I'm gonna think my way around. I'm gonna you know I'm gonna I'll you know sketch here and I'll do this and I'll do that. And but it was the, the more I did that the the tighter I got and the more cut off I got. And now I've sort of realized, you know what? It's going to be there. Mm. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to know the, I don't know it now, but I'm going to know it. Mm. I'm going to know it. And I, I probably, I mean, and whatever I think it is right now won't be exactly what it is. And, you know, I've become much more able to think laterally, um, be, like I said, intuitive, I'm a big believer in this, what people refer to as inner voice, but this kind of thing that is not, doesn't get processed through your head, but like 
comes out of some other part of you. I don't really understand how that, I know how to maximize mm. it, but I don't really, I don't know exactly what it is, mm. but, but it's, uh, but there is a very direct, when you're open, you know, did, I think I said I, this great quote from Declan Donlan, uh, where he says, uh, the question is never who's the most talented, it's who's the most open. Mm. And that's really, really made a huge impression on me. I understand the struggle is to be, the struggle is to be open. The struggle is to be, is to allow yourself to become a channel for what's already developed inside of you. And that's applicable for everyone, not just a creative. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's applicable for absolutely everyone. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Because it means that you're operating out of love and not out of fear. Mm. Uh, and that's, that's a good idea, no matter what your walk of life is. I was, I was going to say, you're again, touching on this kind of this openness, this listening to everything that's going on around you. And yeah, seeing, uh, seeing what's in front of you. Precisely. Yeah. It's a good thing. Mm. I'd recommend it. It's really easy. It's really easy to forget to do it. It's like, you know, it's like when you're working with actors and you're like, do you realize you're not breathing? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like we do these, we do this shit where we just like stop mm. breathing. We just cut ourselves up over our body and we're not even aware that we're doing it. But all that stuff is super important for this instrument, this creative instrument to be open and, 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 you know, responding at the highest level. You got to be in your body. It's a, it's a, we're bodies too, you know, and there's all kinds of intelligence in the body. You, you've done quite a lot of acting in your own films as well, haven't you? Michael? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've acted a lot in the theater. Yeah. I have acted. In, I've acted on film a few times and I, I like it, but I really liked acting in the theater. Yeah. I was going to say, do you, do you find that that has helped you as a director as well? Oh, hugely. I don't know. I don't, I, that I would say, I would not know where to start without that. And both as, as a director, but also as a dramatic writer. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything to me goes back to those, you know, knowing what it feels like to inhabit a character. Cause I mean, it's the same thing you're doing when you're like writing a screenplay, right? Mm. One thing that we like to finish off all our podcasts with is a single question that goes across the board and is, is there a film that you are ashamed you haven't seen? Oh yeah. I'm ashamed I haven't seen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have never seen La Haine, which I ah, really think I should see. Excellent film. Excellent film. Yeah. 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 yeah that's what I hear. Mm. Yeah. So, but I will, I'll get that done. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, like, so, so, oh, we so, get it so, done so, and I'll let you know. <laughs> Yeah, get yeah, yeah. Email in three hours it, time. Yeah, I'll email it. you. As soon <laughs> yeah, as I yeah. yeah, I think it's on the BFI player. I think. I think that's where I watched yeah, it. it. Yeah, it is. It is. That's and an I have excellent the BFI film. player. Just have to sit down and do it. Mm, Fantastic. Really so, Lahain, that was a really quick answer. Yeah, it was a really well. quick answer. It? Yeah, it's, yeah, been, well, it's, it's been on your conscience. Yeah, uh, I need to see it. Yeah. Yeah. No, there, Are there any others just off the top of your head? Oh my God! Yeah, I'm sure lots. Any classics you haven't seen? Yeah. Sure. I mean, let me think what they would be. I mean. I mean, you know, I had one lucky thing that happened to me after, right after when we made Privilege, I had like, I was living in somebody's sofa and I had it, 35 In somebody's pounds. sofa. Just inside, oh, yeah. yeah. He virtual, pulled up the sofa, sofa cushions. Sofa. In a good neighborhood <laughs> in, 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 in Hampstead, a good a sofa in a good neighborhood in Hampstead. But, but so I had 35 pounds a week to live on. And so I would eat these little, I'd buy these little, you know, single servings of cottage cheese and I would go to the Everyman in Hampstead and it would cost like five, five pounds or four pounds. And I would watch like four movies. I'd like watch four Herzog movies or five Fassbender movies or five Godard movies. And I just went. And so like for days on end, when there was something else going up, when I wasn't in the editing room, I would just watch like I lived in the Everyman and I watched hundreds and hundreds wow, of movies. Amazing. So it actually ended up having quite a good background in in you know in, in that was mostly european cinema sure right um but i'm trying to think of things that really have yeah i haven't seen you know what i haven't seen i haven't seen l'enfant de perdi mm -hmm. i haven't seen that mm -hmm. and that is a classic and i should see that you know i mean i just went back through over lockdown all the 70s movies mm -hmm. that i love yeah. five easy pieces mm -hmm. and all the altman and i mean there's some altman i um very the player, movie. what an amazing it's film! A, I mean, that's one of his oh, most no, recent ones. Yeah, yeah. I've seen the player. Yeah, um, player Gosford Park. Nashville is my favorite. Mm, yeah, um, I'm surprised you weren't in the player. Like, there's so many cameos yeah. in that film. It's ridiculous. I know. I would have been. I would have loved to have done that. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear, but Michael, it's been excellent. Thank you so very much. Mm.